Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of the MH podcast, one of the most irregular podcasts in history. We're, we're joined with a very special guest. She's the author of 25 uh, books. She specializes in many issues to do with, uh, could, could we say, pa pa pastoral issues relating to women. She's actually even started a magazine, one of the first to actually have uh, a woman's voice in the Muslim community called The Sister Magazine. Is that correct? Is that right? Yeah, we ran it for 10 years, mashallah. So we're not years. in print anymore, but yeah, yeah, we've... We and, did it for 10 years. and now she continues to to train and mentor people and uh, on how to to write and she has all courses running which i'm so sure you'll be able to see on her socials so let's start off uh, sister naima what kind of issues have you been kind of uh, trying to help sisters with uh, in the muslim community what have you found have been to be the salient issues problematic issues for women in the in the muslim community such that especially male members need to pay attention to Oh, okay. I think I had an answer for the first part of the question and the second part made me think and made me pause. Um, I think what we see within our space um, in terms of what sisters struggle with is a lot of mental barriers. Um, I would say that many, many sisters uh, suffer from uh, a sort of victimhood um, or some kind of imprisonment of the mind more than a lot of other things. Uh, why I say that is because lots of us don't realize really how powerful our own mindset is in determining how we feel about our lives, how we feel about our marriages, about our children, about our prospects. A lot of that is actually what's happening in your mind, right? Not necessarily what's happening on the ground. So the work that I do is geared towards helping sisters and general in people in general understand the power of their own mindset and taking back control of that which they can control. Uh, and, you know, we call it women's empowerment. And we've had this conversation before where, you know, people are wondering, well, what kind of empowerment are you actually talking about? For me, the most potent form of power is self-control, is self-awareness, is, you know, being able to navigate your own mind and being able to regulate yourself. And that's a skill that we don't teach children. We don't teach it to young people. We don't teach it to men or women. Um, so that's really the work that I do, subhanAllah. What is the, um, what are some of those barriers that you speak about? You said you mentioned some mental barriers that women in the community have. From your experience, yeah. um, what are some of those barriers? I would say when I've spoken with sisters and when I've worked with sisters, the predominantly women come to me because they feel that something's missing. Okay. Um, they lack confidence in themselves. Uh, there is a sense of, you know, failure about their lives, wherever they are, whether they're single, married, whether they have children or the children have left the nest. There's this sense that they are not good enough, that they're not worthy, that they're failing somehow. Um, and, you know, that's a really powerful lens to, to look at your life with, the lens of failure. Because if you're looking at your life through the lens of failure, guess what? You're going to find failure everywhere, right? If you're looking at your life through the lens of, you know, I'm not good enough or I'm not good as, as good as so-and-so, that's what you're going to see replicated time and time again. And this is for men and women, you know, the way that we see ourselves impacts directly our experience of, of, of life, of everything that's happening around us. So, you know, for, for me, empowering sisters is helping them to show up, you know, like I talk about, to show up fully for the lives that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for them. And every single one of us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has picked a path for us. And that's the path that matters, not your sister's path or your cousins or your sister-in-law or anyone else. But the path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you on, your responsibilities, the people who count on you, your opportunities, your challenges, the more you focus on living your life intentionally and showing up to every one of those challenges, the more satisfying your life will be, to be honest, and the more fulfilled yeah. you'll be in the life you have right now. And that for me is, is, is golden because it makes everything easier. What are some of the women's specific issues? Because a lot of what you said there could, like you've kind of alluded to, yeah. equally apply to males and females. So what are some of the women's specific issues, which through our own paradigm, like obviously uh, this whole conversation, we're going to assume the Islamic paradigm here, but let's, let's for the sake of argument say through our own paradigm, 
that women have concerns with, that legitimate concerns, which we all need to be aware of. We all need to, 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 to aid in helping them with and uh, that we need to have empathy on. I would say the topic that comes up the most uh, in general is, and not surprisingly, is relationships um, okay. is, is to, and specifically marriage. And then everything that kind of radiates outwards from a marriage, um, whether it's in-laws, whether it's children, whether it's stepchildren, whether it's looking to get married, whether it's healing from a divorce, a lot of the problems that we're seeing in the community do kind of revolve around that relationship between a man and a woman. Um, and certainly over the years, that's the area in which I've seen the most dysfunction in our community. Um, that's where I've seen the most damage being caused, um, the most pain being inflicted kind of both ways. And of course, the fallout is our children uh, and what they see growing up and what they either want to replicate or don't want to replicate. Mm. So I would say if we could get our marriages on point, so many things would change. So many issues that we're having with the children, with the youth, with mental health, with even poverty and things like that. So many of those issues would cease to be an issue if those fundamental relationships were healed and were healthy. Um, because two healthy people, you know, bringing up a family, that's the unit that we're, you know, that, that's the unit that we are striving to create. But when there is unrest, when there is dysfunction, when there is pain in that central relationship, it again radiates outward to everything. So like I said, all of the issues surrounding a marriage <laughs> on, on the, the beginning of it, the end of it, and in the in, the in between, those are, those are all the issues that I see still are issues for our sisters a good 20 years later. So tw I've been Muslim for 20 years, uh, over 20 years now, mashallah, and it's still the same stuff. And sometimes, subhanAllah, I'm actually surprised because I remember when I was deep in the community, I was living in a certain community and it was rough. It was rough. The, 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 the situations that sisters were in, the, the kind of conditions under which they were kind of operating, it was, it was tough. It was tough to witness. It was tough to try to support someone through that process, knowing that there was actually very little you could do. And it's, it's, just, it's kind of dismaying to me to see that we still haven't figured it out. We're still having some of those same issues and sometimes even more now because new issues have come up to basically attack that unit of the family. What are some of those issues in particular that we could say constitute patterns, continuities? Um, like, let me, let me give you one example. Let's give one example, right? And let's, let's put it out there. The idea of an absent father. Okay, and I believe of an absent father. Now, you, you, as you say, you kind of counsel women, you speak to them, you yourself with a single mother, but for completely different reasons, which uh, you intimate in your book, uh, which I'm going to get uh, show wrong. Up. <laughs> show, show up. Show up. Show up. Show up. Show up. Show up. Which we recommend that you get. It's a very powerful uh, book. Just looking at the first kind of 20, 30 pages is, you know, uh, so emotional well written and uh, it's, it's amazing how you articulate yourself but putting that to the side how how, you, how can we how can we frame the idea of the problems that are caused by an absent father uh, in the community what have you seen with your with your clients with your colleagues with your friends what kind of damage does that cause I would say that, you know, the for me, the most shocking thing that I've observed over the years mm. is the seeming, and again, this is anecdotal because I'm not a, a, a social scientist. I haven't got the data, but anecdotal, your anecdotes are important to us, Naima. Your anecdotes are important. Well, because... that's what you're going to get. That's what you're going to get. <laughs> your, no, no, honestly, your think... experiences are very important, especially as we know, there is a dearth or and non-existence in some cases of some of this kind of data, especially within the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. So your, your experience are very important. I think for me, I've, I've been very vocal about this on social media. Um, you know, my videos are all over Instagram or whatever, but for me, the most shocking thing that I've seen in this area is when there is a divorce and the father is basically, he's gone. He's left the, he's left the marriage, he's left the wife and he's left the kids. And 
I don't understand the thinking behind that mm. um, because I know so many sisters who, when there's a divorce, they are literally on their own. So they are not only responsible for the children on a day-to-day -day basis, but they are responsible for them economically, socially, in terms of school, in terms of everything. The father is he's, he's out, he's out. And mm. I, I, I've said this before, um, we really, really need to start thinking so much more carefully and being so much more intentional when we start families. Because as I have said before, the children pay the price. Hmm. And that trauma that we, are, that we are living through our broken homes, our children are carrying that trauma and they will carry it into their families as well. So I, I've, I can think of a particular situation where you know, the father was around, he was working, he was a breadwinner. Um, and the divorce was, was not amicable at all. It was a very, very difficult divorce, uh, but it was one of those where it was like, this cannot continue. When he left the home, he mm -hmm. stopped speaking to the children completely. He oh cut off God. from them completely. They would ring him. He wouldn't pick up. They would leave well, voice messages. It's really he this, to be honest, this kind of thing, Naima, sorry to chime in here, but this kind of thing really does make me sick because it's, I think if anything, it exposed the true character of that person. Like their true colors came out when that, that particular man, his true colors came out when the divorce took place. Because if you're willing to sacrifice your children for something that's completely no fault of their own, that must mean at least that your love for yourself is mm. far exceeds anything else in life. It's, it's, it's like the ultimate manifestation of narcissism. Like I'm going to teach everyone a lesson. I don't care what collateral damage mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. just so mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you know, they know who I am and what I'm about. It I think that there is that. Men, I think, honestly, sorry to chime in yeah. I think these men should be exposed, honestly. Like if, if in, these, in the community, if a man is genuinely doing that to, to putting the kids, uh, you know, in harm's way in that manner, I think that the community, the, 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 I don't know if this is a strong stance in your perspective, maybe get your perspective on it, but the community, the imams, the, his friends should uh, do anything that by any means necessary to influence yeah. his behavior because that is, for me, uh, despicable and deplorable action. And he should be boycotted. He should be, uh, so the, the, hard, the hard approach should be used on him, the, the kind approach. But this kind of person should, mm -hmm. shouldn't be just allowed to live in society normal. He just left right. his kids. And so, I don't know. Am I having, a, am I having yeah. an emotional reaction to this? Or do you think I'm justified? No, no. I, I, think, I think you're justified. I think we, if we, I, I have observed this over the years. And, you know, anybody who sees it differently is free to disagree. But what I've seen in the communities that I've known is that brothers give each other a pass. You know, whatever you yes. do in your private life, Achi, nothing to do with me. Like, that's your family. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to step into your territory. Well, I'm not going to make that you left feel behind, some kind it? of way. Yeah. Whatever's yeah. happening, whatever yeah. the case, it mm. could be that there's injustice happening at home, that sister is like, you know, it's known in the community that sister is desperately unhappy or that he's taken away her rights in some shape or form or whatever, but he's still a brother. And he's still welcome and he still gets salam and he still has, mm. you know, his place in the society because I don't know whether it's like a, a is a thing, a rare thing, but for us as sisters, I'll be honest, and this is something that sisters have been saying for years and years, mm. it's like no one ever tells the brothers anything. The, mm. Anytime that there's advice or khutbahs or warnings, it's always to the sisters. Sisters mm. fear Allah, sisters wear hijab, sisters do this, sisters do that, obey your husbands, sisters give him what he wants, it's sisters, sisters, sisters. And unfortunately, we're human beings. Sisters mm. are doing wrong and brothers are doing wrong. Mm. But what we don't often hear or see from the, the elders in the community is brothers actually being pulled up and said, ah, you can't do this, you know, mm. whether it's on a sort of grassroots level, person mm -hmm. to person or even from the member to say brothers ittaqullah you know this mm -hmm. is not acceptable in our deen and actually teaching our brothers that because i'll just I just yes. want to make this point yes in our communities many many times you'll find that we enable bad behavior especially amongst men and boys mm -hmm. we enable it how do we enable it? By making excuses for it, by not pulling them up on it. Domestic violence is a great example. Okay, mm. when there's actual violence in the home, yeah, there's actually violence or there's alcohol abuse or there's drugs or anything mm. like that. The family's response is typically to cover. Mm. 
and to shield, right? Mm. We don't want to get the police involved. We don't want the neighbors involved. We don't want the community involved. And if the woman has the audacity to speak up, she's the one who's shamed. She's mm -hmm. the one who's blamed. How could you embarrass us like this? You know, mm -hmm. it's your fault. He did X, Y, and Z. It's very easy to blame and shame the woman rather mm -hmm. than actually addressing this issue with your son and saying, in our family, this is not acceptable. So we become mm -hmm. a community of enablers. And the okay, thing but is, before we move on with this conversation, usually, yeah, sorry, know, sorry, Naima, sorry to chime in. Like, before we move on, the, the issue here is when we use terms like domestic violence, you know, um, I told you, I think, before we started the show, that uh, I wrote a small little pamphlet book, uh, which was really the um, combination, the combined effort of my postgraduate essays that I've done on uh, gender studies. Um, anyway, one of them was about domestic violence. And what I found was problematic. There was a particular woman uh, who wrote a definition for what domestic violence is. Her name was Kumase, I think I'm co correctly uh, pronouncing her name. And she says something to the effect of, and I'm paraphrasing, but this is it's in my book if someone wants to see, um, that domestic violence is um, is defined as is defined as when one spouse, um, you know, uh, ab abuse of one spouse to another or violence violence of one spouse to another, uh, usually, and this is exactly what she said in her definition, usually from a man to a woman. Yeah. Now, Ooh, wow. any 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 social scientist will tell you this is a problem because it it begs the question. In a sense, it's kind of assumed the answer of the question before it started it. So it, it, you, you couldn't put the results, like the hypothesis and the conclusion should be two different things. Uh, the issue yeah. with uh, the, the terms like domestic violence and, and rape and, and these kinds of terms is what whose definition are we really using? Are we using the definition mm -hmm. of Kumasai, who's already uh, put her conclusion in her hypothesis? Are we mm -hmm. using the definition of uh, McKinnon, who ref defines rape as sexual intercourse, any sexual intercourse, even with uh, Catherine McKinnon says that it's rape, it's even with consent. Uh, so wow. w the issue with using these terms, and especially sometimes the legal definitions, are so vague. Mm -hmm. what, what are the definitions of abuse? Like, for example, um, the, the, you can have monetary abuse. Well, what does monetary yeah. abuse look like? Yeah. Well, you're not giving a pocket money, enough pocket money. What kind of pocket money do you need? How, uh, uh, what are we well, talking about? Well, it's not really like that. It's yeah. more, you know, if, if a person is, has money and then um, they're um, my issue, away from that money. Got you. But yeah. Naima, my issue is when we have these such wide definitions of these things, right? Yeah. As, so you say, well, she's been raped. And what he means by well, McKinnon's definition, being raped means someone had sex with her. But on, some, on the governmental definition is the insertion of the penis or whatever it may be. By the way, rape on the UK law can only be done by a man to a woman. It is discriminatory by... Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. There's no such thing as rape. A, a woman, it can, she can sexually assault a man, but she cannot rape a man, UK law, for example. But anyway, putting that to the side, even though you can imagine her, sorry to, sorry to be explicit, but she can put some knife in him or she can put a bottle in him. She can do something. She can, she can sedate oh, him. Yes. She can, all these things are possible, yeah. but, you know, it's only defined in, in that way. But putting that all to the side, the point is, whoever gets to set the definition gets to control the narrative. Whoever gets to control the narrative gets to call the shots. And, and my issue with a lot of these key terms is that if we don't have it in the Islamic narrative, mm -hmm. and we use these terms like abuse, domestic violence, and what's it, what, what, what all these things, then uh, it can easily come in, someone can come in with another agenda, and take mm -hmm. our community to a completely different direction. Would you agree to that? Or to what extent would you agree to that? Um, well, of course, it's plausible. But do you think that's what's happened with the community? Do you think Once that again, we've been kind of, mm. kind of coerced? Yeah, I think there are examples of one. I'll give you one example where I think maybe we'll both agree, right? One example where we definitely both agree is that in the Islamic law, right, we, we believe that kins, ties of kinship should, not, should be respected. Yeah. We talked about the case of the absent father, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also the Who case... Who was of... voluntarily absent father, yeah. Who's <laughs> yeah, just yeah, basically yeah. like done a, done a runner, yeah. But what about the case also of the, the woman who's weaponizing the chil children and leveraging them in, after a divorce in order to spite the father? Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. happens a lot, so much so that it's... I mean, organizations like Fathers for Justice and these kinds of... Yeah. They have come up. And let, let me give you a, a real scenario, which I think you're aware of, right? Say, for example, a man and woman get separated for whatever reason it may be. Yeah. Man and woman get separated. The woman has custody of the children. She's the primary custodian, custodian of the children. She takes care of them and so on. Now he wants to have access to his child. 
so there's they have to arbitrate they have to go to court family court in the uk and so on yeah in the meantime he can't see his children in the meantime she has she she is barring him preventing him mm. stopping him from seeing the children and for every second that she's stopping him from seeing the children from an islamic perspective she's sinning not even every second every millisecond mm. and she's not just sinning for that her, she's sinning for stopping the extended family for example the yeah. man's the grandparents of the children family. or mm. the aunties the uncles from seeing those children again as well and you you were talking about and it's true and i do agree that there is this kind of culture of gender bias it, it might not be feminism or red pill or whatever it may be but it could be gender bias. like where genuinely people think that you know uh, he's he's one of he's one of the guys and whatever so i'm not going to say anything but i think on the other hand as well you do have gender bias from the from the sisters as well like sometimes mm -hmm. she'll see that her friend is preventing yeah. her ex-husband from seeing the kids her friend will make bogus excuses yeah mm. and he's not doing it my way he's not giving me enough money whatever it yeah. is and she will acquiesce to that as well would you agree is that yeah. happening yeah i think i i would say i agree i think there's a general kind of uh, opinion that women back each other up and it's even got a name it's called girl code right out there in the world um where women validate each other women back each other up no matter what right I would say within the Muslim community, the sisters who don't do that are the ones who are firmly rooted in deen. Because mm. when you love someone for the sake of Allah, it's, true, it's not about girl code. It's not about, yeah, you're my girl and yeah, whatever. It's sis, this is haram. What you're exactly. Doing, you know? And I have witnessed those conversations before. And someone has said, you know, I have been involved in those conversations. Say, sis, have you checked to see whether that is okay? You know, have you asked anybody about that? And or with something like this, doing, oh, 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 yeah, sorry um, to cut you off. Sorry, I'm, I'm cutting up a bit too much. Here. But with something like this, you don't need to check. Like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, La yeah. jannah qati'un. You know, that someone who, who cuts the kins of uh, kinship is not going to go to heaven. Yeah. So yeah. this is such a, like, it's a clear thing. It's ma'lum min ad-deen bil-darura, actually. It, it, you yeah. opened the Quran, the second or third page, I don't know. It's there. Mm -hmm. The ones who cut uh, the the ties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted mm -hmm. to be maintained and then they create corruption in the land. Any tafsir will tell you that's not just, you know, your parents and your grandparents and dashir or the extended family, but it's even your friends and your neighbors and these kinds of things as well. So, I mean, imagine someone stopping their children from seeing a parent. That's yeah. stopping the child from, that is stopping the child from performing an obligatory act. That is yeah. stopping the parent from performing an obligatory act. Mm -hmm. that, is, um, th that is causing emotional damage to someone unjustly. Yeah. That is all of those things and more. What, what do you think about that? You know, as you're saying all of this, I'm just thinking of, I'm thinking of it from sort of two angles. And I think my, my conclusion is that as, as human beings, we, we just need to sort it out. Because just as, okay, so there's one thing. This happening to men, because men, especially Muslim men, up until very recently, have not really had spaces where they have talked about their lived experience. Mm -hmm. It's always assumed that the brother is a, the brothers are okay. The brothers mm -hmm. are cool because they have all the power, they have all the control, they get to do whatever they want, and basically they're never the victims. Women are the victims. Sisters mm -hmm. are always the victims, right? So, exactly, and I think yeah. that is a narrative in our community. That is a narrative. Mm. Um, and I think it's because sisters will talk about their problems. Sisters have been much more vocal of late about the issues that they go through, etc. So we know what each other are going through. Mm -hmm. But brothers may not speak to each other, but they certainly have not up until lately really been speaking honestly about, hey, you know what? I'm struggling with this or this has happened to me and I'm suffering because of this. So even in our minds, the idea of a Muslim man suffering because of a woman, it's like, what are you talking about? Exactly. That never happens. It's exactly. always the Muslim woman who's suffering because of a Muslim man. Exactly. Right? It's, the sh it's the chivalry so, so, effect. So that it is the chivalry effect. Especially when you hear the woman, like, you know, if, if a person, a judge or an arbitrator or a third party, another stakeholder of some yeah. sorts, and they literally just see and hear the woman. Like, yeah. you just hear yeah. and see the woman crying. It's enough. She has won already. Yeah. Like, it, or at least she has <laughs> convinced... True. You know, but if you see a big man, you know, a, a huge man with yes. dominance, and especially if he's an extrovert, yes, it's almost like there's no yeah. chance. He's got no chance. Are you, are you telling me that exactly. she's oppressing him? You know, yeah. how? So this is, this is something that 
this is something that I want to just touch on, and I hope it's not, you know, too too um, open for this audience. But I'll, I'll give you another example. Nothing is where... too open for my audience, uh, Naim. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, as I, I have two sons, and I have I have three sons, and I have two daughters. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. And so, when I'm looking at gender in general, I feel I have a responsibility to be as balanced as possible, and to yeah. be as fair as possible, and to be as just as possible. So. Yeah. Just as you're talking about men who are having their children weaponized, um, I can't, I cannot say that's not happening. Mm. You know how we always say believe women? Mm. Uh, and also we've had many situations where women have come forward and said this is happening to us and the brothers have been like, no, or the imam or the sh- whoever is like, I oh, know sister, you must have done this, you must have done that. Similarly, I must extend the same grace to brothers. So if brothers come forward and they say, look, I haven't seen my kids for two years and I've been trying, but X, Y, Z, we have to give them the benefit of the doubt. We have to think that it's possible that that is true. Just like if a sister came to me, I would, you know, I would give her the benefit of the doubt and say, you know what, sis, I hear you. Anyway. No, but um, the burden of proof, like, can I just say something here? Yeah. The bur- we're not, we're not, the brother's not coming forward and saying the, the woman has raped me or she has, the, the kind of things that, you know, require a heavy burden of proof in Islam. It's, she's not coming and saying that. It's, that is the the burden of to establish a woman is stopping a man from seeing his children is fairly you can say fairly simple all they have to do yeah, is it test is. it out come uh, see them on a saturday are you going to be there or not if 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 not why not why are you not going to bring the kid he wants to see them on saturday yeah. uh they want to see him on saturday you know this is the time that he's willing to take them uh, is that allow are you allowing this or are you not allowing this all you have to do is yeah. basic if you ask this question you will be able to establish whether the person is barring right. the person from, so you don't need four witnesses for this it's, it's, it's an easy burden yeah. of proof and so what i'm saying is yeah. it's, it's definitely happening i mean me, i'm sorry i've um, might have said the story before but me and ali dawa we went to uh, and he'll remember this he went to sacramento in california and there was a story that stuck with me you know this man who's they were telling me he went to the masjid you know, he went to the masjid and uh, every day and Fajr, I think he, they were saying he goes to Fajr. And then he had a bad divorce. And they were telling me that, uh, you know, the, he had his last day with his daughters. He's, he had two daughters he had his last day with them. And he couldn't bear that, you know, the other woman now she's married another man and that the courts have all have ruled in her favor. So he, he done a monstrous act. You know, he went to the lake and he killed both of those daughters and he killed himself. You know, and this yeah. is from the... Un, involuntary i'm not even gonna, he was responsible for this but this 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 disgusting behavior or this this kind of reaction took place because of an initial injustice now two wrongs obviously and cannot make you can never ever justify something like that but the truth is we can avoid these kind of things another situation i heard is just a person who's been prevented from seeing the children literally died from it, it literally had uh, panic attacks seizures until they died from it why did that happen? Oh, because he had a secret second wife or something happened. He went to this country and he, you know, and then the woman found out and she said, you're never going to see your children again. And a few years down the line, he just, he couldn't, he, his health couldn't handle it. And he deteriorated and died because of a stroke or some, uh, some heart attack or something, which is related to it. Now, all I'm saying is these kind of things, if we're really honest about it, could be prevented, but they, we need to have, a, I don't know. Tell me if I'm wrong. Cause once again, I'm not a pastoral, uh, my specialism is not pastoral counseling or something like this. It's more, this is why I've, you know, I'll ask you honestly, do we not, should we not use a really a sledgehammer approach with this? Like either if we're talking about the, the absent father mm-hmm. or we're talking about the weaponizing mother yeah. in either, should we not really, you know, should we, should we not really expose these people? Should we not really, um, re- let the community know who these people are so that they're unmarriable they shouldn't be married like, because mm-hmm. if you think about it right if they're capable yeah. of not seeing their children in the case of the absent father they're capable of leaving their kids alone uh, or they're capable of weaponizing their kids that means that they're capable mm-hmm. of putting the, their children as human shields in this proverbial game of leverage uh, that yeah. means what kind of person are you you're a narcissist you're a bad person and you and if anyone's going to marry you, they're going to have a hell, hell of a life because that means you're only going to be thinking about yourself. If you can't even think about your children, then you can't. You will not think about a partner properly. You will not. You will not be courteous and compassionate and empathetic. Mm. Am I? Am I being a bit too emotional with this? <laughs> Tell me um, I, I, as I said before, the family is the unit. 
right? Mm -hmm. And our families are under extreme pressure. The family itself is under attack at the moment. We know this. And Muslim families are just, if, if not more under attack, we are just as, as, as vulnerable. We think we're not, but we are. And for me, sledgehammer, eh, okay, it's a possible approach. But I am more concerned about us preparing people for properly for marriage, for parenthood. We, don't, we still don't have enough premarital counseling we don't have enough therapy and counseling for people, Aslan, because that man who went and killed his daughters, it's not just because his wife wouldn't let him see and he had a divorce. Obviously, the man was hurting. Obviously, he was not OK. Mm. So mental health, big issue. Mm. Counseling within the marriage, helping people to strengthen their marriages, to, mm. you know, to work on things, right? To, to actually, you know, if, then, if they can't work at it, if they can't make it work, should I say, then how can we manage the separation? Because mm. all I care about is the children. I'll be honest. Yeah. You two, you man, you woman, you're adults. Do whatever you want. You want to have a secret marriage? Go ahead. You want to have Miss Yar? Go ahead. You want to have four women? You want to marry two, you know, three men, one after the other? Do whatever you want. But the children, the children, they are the ones who experience the fallout. And so... I, I like the way you tried to balance it there. You know, you, you, you gave... You give a female example. Yes. <laughs> because the reality is we can yeah. all do bad, Muhammad. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. We can do bad just by ourselves, you know, and this this idea, and I might get flat yeah, but, this, but, but, but Naima, Naima. Because the, re the reality is, yeah. the reality is, even if a woman, for example, let's take, uh, let's assume yeah. that the woman does not have the upper hand. She has the lower hand, right? Yeah. The man is over her. Her father is over her, whatever the case may be, right? Do you think that that woman does not have power to be evil mm. just because she doesn't have the upper hand? Of course she can. And I'll tell yeah. you where you see it the most. You're talking about weaponizing the children. What about we weaponizing intimacy? That's a real thing. And well, here's, here's, what, here's what I'm going to say. Look, you're talking right. about secret second wives. I mean, if, if someone's doing something like that, I would go and tell them to get three secret second wives. I mean, to be honest with you, she's she's three doing secret second wives. Yeah, get three because I, I know this sounds maybe harsh or something, but if, if a woman is doing something which is clearly haram, which is weaponizing all, intimacy, specifically weaponizing intimacy, then that, a secret right. second wife, which is uh, he means not telling the first wife, which is not even a shot in the nikah, cannot even be compared to that in the least. With all due respect, this yeah. is complete. They're two different uh, uh, things altogether. So if she's not doing it and then he knows that if he's going to tell her that he's going to be in polygamy, that she's going to take his kids and go to another country or, or bar him, mm -hmm. then maybe secret, mm -hmm. maybe secret second wives are the way to go for such people. I mean, you know, now, yeah. what do you think? OK, I, I'm not going to go down on paper saying, yes, secret second wives are a thing. We're not going to say <laughs> that. But, but, but I think, again, I, my, really what I want to say and the point I want to make is that we must be careful of buying into the narrative that only the dominant party can be evil. Only the dominant party can oppress. Only the one who has a level higher can actually do wrong. And the person who is under is always right, is always a victim, is always, you know, basically not to blame. That's not true. Okay. Yes. It's not the fact. And anyway, as, as we said, you know, uh, and the thing is, again, it's not something we talk about very often. But if you if, if you start, this is this is I'll just give you a little bit of background. I have not spoken about these issues before, because up until last year, I never listened to men anyway. Right. Muslim men didn't really talk about their own personal issues. And just in general, in the culture, the culture around us is very female. It's very, very female dominated the culture i'm not talking about economy i'm not talking about politics i mean the culture okay mm. and it's not only very female but it's also very female centric so women's stories dominate women's view of the world now dominate women's ways of emoting ways of expressing themselves they dominate the culture that we live in western culture right yes so it's very easy to get a feel for what women like and what women don't like and how women see the world that's very easy but to find out how men feel and how men see the world and how men experience the world's actually been a lot harder up until a year or two ago, certainly for me. So all of this, even uh, weaponizing intimacy, I would never have thought it was an issue because I never heard men talking about it. And of course, women are not going to talk about that. Sisters are not gonna sit around saying, yeah, it's been three months. 
yeah, until I get that car or anything like that. That's not going to happen. OK. And, you know, and to be honest, you know, in certain places that might even be applauded, it's like, go get yours, girl. You no know? way. But um, have you ever heard something like no, that? Not no, not among sisters, sisters, not sisters, sisters, you know, but just within. The thing is, We're holding I, I've seen, so, what, what, not, not what, sisters. What? Is she asexual? This is not she doesn't she want it herself or something? Maybe she's maybe she I has mean, there's lots tendencies. of different things. There's lots of different. No, uh, brother Muhammad, we're not going down that road. Come Why? back. Well, I mean, three you, months. You turn, so you turn and come like, back. What's going on? Three months. What's happening? What? You, she doesn't want herself. If everyone's interest, anyone's interested in, in like knowing more about this, you just have to just search YouTube, and you will see. Uh, so three many months. Sorry, sorry to say, three months is a, is a very, very is, is a very big example. We should be talking about three hours or three days. Would you like? To, how about how about two years? How about two years? <laughs> two years. <laughs> <laughs> the brother's sorry. laughing i'm That's really sorry so what do you expect him to do in maybe that you can't imagine it but maybe you can't imagine it but wallahi this is the lived reality for some men some muslim men as well, well. Uh, then the secret second wife you can't fathom it very viable yeah you can't night, fathom I it <laughs> but i mean can, can we say? i think no i i i, I think that if you know, you are in a situation where, you know, intimacy is being withheld, okay, for whatever reason, right, because it's, it's Sharia wise, and in general, in, in, in terms of, you know, marital relationships. And, and Sharia, this would be seen as abuse, by the way, oppression. And yeah, 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 of course. It, it, yeah, I mean, it is seen as Domestic abuse, violence, um, <laughs> domestic abuse. Probably <laughs> is like domestic <laughs> violence, domestic abuse. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, you'll see that. Oh, can you pause, Muhammad? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just cut that, please. It's oh gosh. Um, am I still on? Yes, I am. Yeah. Am I still here? It's not live. It's not live, by the way. Okay, cool. Yeah. Oh no, because I was signed out of my account. Okay, okay no worries. We'll, okay, we'll, we'll oh, sort but that I'm still bit here, up. so that's cool. That's fine. Okay, Bismillah. Where was I? Um. Yeah, we're holding intimacy. Let's let's go back to this. Okay, so. Yeah. Bismillah. Bismillah, man, rahim. So um, so that so when I say. Uh, that this is something that people are going through, you will see that obviously in, there is no space in which it is acceptable for either partner to withhold from the other. But what we're seeing is, you know, it's like, it's, it's a thing. Weaponizing intimacy is a thing. Uh, see, may Allah guide us. I, mean, I, I want to ask Amin. you just tonight, right now. Um, <laughs> I know I'm taking up a lot of your time. I'm, I'm not going to take too much of your time. I know you're, you're very busy, but I wanted to ask now, the issues that we're facing, a lot with, with like the females, I've heard you speak about this before, I want you to kind of articulate it the way you've heard you said it before. Um, the, the issues relating to like how some sisters can perceive what men do as always oppressive. Mm. Mm. Why? By virtue of this feminist kind of second wave narr narrative, which is that mm. man is the oppressor by domination because he is... He is in power over the woman, the, hier right. the managerial hierarchy that is set in place by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ta'a, mm -hmm. the qawama, all these concepts. They are themselves oppressive. So if you, if you so much as enact them, then you are the agent of oppression. How do you combat uh, this? How do you talk to, to, talk to this? You know, subhanAllah, um, for me, the mm. answer for me, and I could be wrong, but whenever these questions come up, I feel the answer, I, I believe that the answer is always found in the Sira. Mm. And why I say this is because the Sira was the lived example, right? Mm -hmm. That was the lived experience of our deen. That's how people actually applied it, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we know from the Sira is balance. Mm. However, what we need to be careful uh, and everybody needs to be aware of the fact that we live in a cultural context, okay? And that cultural context, wherever you are in the world, whichever era you live in, it impacts the way you view things. Mm -hmm. So in the 1950s, for example, Islamic values were pretty much in line with society's values. Traditional gender roles, Man's the head of the household. You know, when daddy comes home, you know, he comes and deals with the problems. He goes out to work. Mom stays home with the children. Muslims would not have been strange at that time, okay? Because the society was pretty much based on that. Fast forward to the 70s now, Muslims are starting to look a bit old fashioned, starting to look a bit out of touch. Fast forward to today and our sense 
of what is balance has shifted dramatically. Let's put it that way. So those of us who are especially younger, you know, we're trying to make sense of everything. We're trying to make sense of our identity, trying to make sense of who we are as individuals. What, you know, what does our Islam mean to us? You know, how much of, you know, which of our identities takes precedence and all of these things, because those are the questions that young people are asking now because of the society that we live in. And so what we may see as fair, what we may see as balanced, what we may see as just may not be what Allah sees as fair and balanced and just. We, we have to be aware of the fact that we live in a paradigm, okay? We are in a context. And a lot of people I find, uh, a lot of us think that our views are our own, you know? They come from ourselves. You know, people that are my truth. I'm speaking my truth. This is, this is how I see things, right? <laughs> Not understanding that your opinion or your ideas and your feelings, et cetera, they are, they didn't, they're not created in a vacuum. They're not something that sprung up from a well within. It is a, a, a <laughs> combination of what you learned growing up, what your parents taught you, what you learned in school, what books you read, what films you watch, what music you listen to, the friends you have, the social media you're on, all of that is impacting you all the time. And that's your paradigm. So I digress. When we look at the, what you called it a managerial hierarchy, and we look at the Prophet Sallallahu I would love to go back to the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi because you know, we're having this conversation about masculinity. We're having these conversations about alpha and beta and dominance and all of this kind of thing. And what we see really without any bias, when we look at the seerah, we see a man who was holistically masculine because we know that every one of us has got masculine and feminine tendencies inside us anyway, right? We have, the, we have those energies. When you see the Prophet Sallallahu and how he was able to be strong and decisive and dominant and, 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 and have a goal and go after it and fight and order for people to be punished and all of these alpha traits, right? Because that's what alpha is, but we are, that's how we're seeing it now. Strong, dominant, etc. masculine. He also had flip side of masculinity which is the ability to be humble to be protective to make people feel safe to make people feel like you know grounded because that's the beta side of the male it's not alpha good beta bad that's just ridiculous it's just that you have the ability to be both right and the prophet sallam when you see him with his family he had a balance of both we've got stories of him laying down the law and we've got stories of him completely giving up his right and it didn't mean anything. We, 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 I don't have to go into the stories in the Sira because I think we all know what I'm talking about. And so when we look at the ideal, at the ideal that we are aiming for, especially brothers, I wanna speak to brothers on this point. I also wanna speak to sisters because sisters, you want to be married to a brother, hopefully, maybe you are married to a brother and hopefully you're raising future husbands. So being able to appreciate that a real man is one who is grounded in his belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his sense of mission and purpose. He is humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his actions are all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no ego, right? There's no ego. There's no my way or the highway because I want it to. This should not be the way that we think, right? But that man, he will have to make decisions. Some of those decisions, you will not like them but that's his huck to make those decisions. And that man as well is responsible for making you feel safe and secure and loved and protected and looked after. So I don't know, I guess the, 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 the long story for me is if we can go back to that model and understand it and know what it will take from us to be able to embody that standard, we'll be on our way to something special. At the moment, yeah. everyone's on ego. Everyone's on myself what I want, what I like, women and men, right? Now yes. that's why we're clashing because the sisters now, they wanted their peace, right? Before it was the brother wanted his peace and everybody had to kind of run circles around him. Now the sisters are like, no, 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 no. I also want my peace. And that's partly why a lot of our marriages are fracturing because yeah. all of a sudden, you know, there's this, there's this power shift, this, this dynamic that's shifted. But sometimes the original power dynamic was not the healthiest dynamic and it wasn't on Sunnah. It was something else something cultural, something, whatever. Mm. I was going to say, I was going to say, um, that's really well put. The, the only thing I would just kind of like talk about here, well, I want to, I want to kind of clarify it. Cause I'm, I mean, you know, the whole red pill movement we've spoken about, I've, me and Ali Dao made a video about the MGTOWs and the red pill and whatever they'll call themselves, you know, 
And these terms Cal like, and red pill are not the same thing, but anyway, yeah, <laughs> go they, on. They, they have very similar ideas, you know. But it, the red pill have their ideas, MGTOW have their ideas. A lot of it is to is is a reaction to feminism, in my view. 100%, anyway, 100%, yeah, you you know, whatever it may be, the, the, the terms alpha and beta, the reason why I personally don't use them or don't subscribe to them is because so what they because there is a connotation, just like with the patriarchy, you know, I don't accept the term patriarchy. The, the, right. the reason why I don't accept the term patriarchy, like some men use the term in a positive sense. They're trying to reown the word or something like that. Oh, the word okay. patriarchy has historically and in the literature always connoted sure. at least, if not mm. sometimes even de been defined as a systematic mm. oppression, oppression of women yeah. by men or through yeah. domination or power structures and all that. Yeah. Now, if I'm, if I'm affirming something which is known in the, in the culture to be oppressive, then I'm not doing a favor to... The mm -hmm. model of Islam, which I'm trying to to, to to espouse. Likewise, the word beta here, it has. You're not, you're not reclaiming the word beta, no. No, you're no. Not down I don't want to reclaim any. Look, because it's already been it's already been mm. distorted. Painted by the conversation. yeah. It's, it's beta is is uh, even though they don't maybe define it, they don't have any books or, or very limited academic works on these kind of things. It's all what's in, on social media now. It's kind of like a social media thing. Yeah. Uh, it's being used in a pejorative sense. It's being used in a weak sense. He's a yes, it's male. true. Uh, this, this is the bait. Yeah. Go in the Joe Rogan experience of the bait ML and laughing at him. Yeah, yeah. Sure. No, that's true. Do you know what I mean? So, so what, I, what it is is that the way it's... I okay, so can I just say, sorry, just yeah. before we go further, yeah. just for anybody who who is listening to this and watching it, Please do not go and tell people, Sister Naima called the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a beta male. Okay? No, no, she because... didn't. She didn't. She didn't. And I, <laughs> I, I can, I, I know that you, I know that you, have, you were very careful uh, in your articulation, and definitely she didn't say that. Uh, that would be lying about you anyway. Don't worry, you didn't say that. But what I was going to say was um, the qualities that are like compassion, for example, compassion. Yeah. Compassion is associated with what? Maybe beta, but this is something which is for us seen as Allah is Ar-Rahim. What is he a beta? <laughs> but that's because oh, oh, you're using oh, oh, the beta oh, 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 as from... an insult. You're say... using the beta as an insult. So yeah, yeah. That is the problem. Because For beta, instance, the... yeah. yeah, go on. Another one is, on. is leadership. And this whole thing of alpha, alpha, one of the things that I'm always seeing on these social media things is that alpha male is a leader. Our religion doesn't tell us to go and opt to be leaders. Honestly, it does not tell us to go and want to be leaders. Our religion places more emphasis on obedience than anything else, not just for women, but for men as well. Mm. And not obedience mm. to <laughs> not obedience to just the, uh, Allah. لا تعطني مخلوق في معصية الخالق that there's no obedience to the creation and the disobedience to the creator, but also obedience to the creation. There's very harsh hadiths. Uh, 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 you have to be mm. strong with the wali al-amr. You have to uh, obey the wali al-amr. There are hadiths like that in the deen. And... Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So what is it telling us? There's only one ayah in the Quran, only one that I can think of, which is the dua to be a leader, which is wajalna lil muttaqina imama. The one verse, the mm. only one time we are we're kind of incentivized, if at all incentivized to be leaders, mm. is what Allah is pushing us to make a dua where we don't get it from our own nafs. Because being a leader is being Allah. arrogant. It's, it's what you want to be a leader. Why? So you can yeah. assert yourself. So you can be dominant. Who you want to be dominant? Allah is the Ali. We're trying to like... We're trying to do a'la of kalimatullah. We're trying to make Allah's kalam dominant, mm. not ourselves dominant. So in fact, man tawada'a lillah rafa'ahullah. Whoever humbles himself to Allah, Allah raises him. So this idea this, of yeah. what leaders mm. and this and that, what, usually those people who are most hungry to be leaders are the worst leaders anyway. You know, the ones who are good leaders, mm -hmm. they never think of themselves as good leaders. They, people push them to that position. They never opt for that position themselves. So the, this idea of what's alpha is connected with the leader, this is un-Islamic, actually. Oh, not... hold on. I'm going to push back on that. I'm going to push no, back on you that. Should, no, no let, me, let, me, let me clear up, clarify before you come yeah. back. What I mean is you should not desire leadership. You, you can be a good leader, but you don't need to desire it. Desiring it is problematic because it, it is a form of, I want to impose myself on other people. Yeah. Our deen is not about mm. power like that. Our deen is about we just that, okay that's that's the food. yeah that's the point that i want to get to yeah, because yeah. i think that you know even in you know certain discourses right the issue of of um you know male dominance etc uh patriarchy etc everything is about power right um and when we look at leadership in the deen looking at the shepherd for example every one of you is a shepherd of their flock and you'd be questioned about them what does that mean it's not leading to dominate 
it's leading to take responsibility. So every man is their mirror of his household. He leads the household because he takes responsibility. And by the, in the hadith, so, say it women as well. Kullukum ra'in wa kullu ra'in exactly. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, you know, everyone has, every one of us is a shepherd, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I personally, I would love to see more of our brothers developing themselves to be the very best that they can be and leading their families. Because mm. even though we have a big, you know, very loud, maybe minority complaining about toxic masculinity, we have also a very vocal, I would even say majority of sisters saying, where are the men? Where are the men who know how to be men? What does that mean as far as they're concerned? Who can take care of the household, who can lead us, who can protect us, who will bust his, his, his backside to make sure that we have what we need because sisters are overworked right now. And sisters have been overworked for a while. And again, again, it's all anecdotal. But when you hear about sisters whose husbands, he could even be present, but she's, she's doing everything. She's you know, getting money for the kids, it's her house. She's working as well. You know, the money's coming from the government and he's not really kind of bringing anything to the table, et cetera. These issues, a lot of those sisters that I said, I just wish he would grow up. I just wish that he would man up. And I, I know it's, it's not like, it's not politically correct to tell a man to man up, but this is, this is what women need. We do need men who see themselves in that role as I'm responsible for this flock. And it's my responsibility to myself to optimize myself in every way that I can so that I can do right by these, this amana that Allah has given me. So I think if you were to see more brothers stepping up and deciding to work on themselves, Dean emotionally getting, you know, and mental health issues out of the way, physically, you know, getting healthy, you know, finding ways to, to kind of maximize their income and the impact they have in the community, you would find a lot more sisters who are happy to let them lead and happy yeah. to relax into their feminine role. And yeah. it wouldn't be this type of fight, but I could be wrong. No, no, I appreciate all of that. And, and I think you've articulated it very well, but I think there's one thing which is conspicuously missing in the articulation. Mm. Mm. which is that we, you've mentioned health, you mentioned mental health, and you mentioned, uh, you, you've mentioned finances. But the, the one That's thing which well. is that the dean actually hierarchizes is not any of those things, but is, is religiosity. I did That's mention fine. spiritually at the beginning. It was the did first you? thing I said, actually, I did. But yeah. okay, let me be more clear about this, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in Surah Mujadila, he mentions, يَرْفَعَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ that Allah, in terms of hierarchies, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he raises amongst you, those who have believed among you and those who have been given ilm, knowledge in darajat. Mm -hmm. This knowledge, Islamic knowledge, uh, as you know, the hadith is very famous. Whoever wants good, Allah who wants good for them, Allah, he gives them knowledge of the religion or understanding of the religion even, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Now, the, the thing is, like, when men are looking for women to get married to or women are looking to men, this whole red pill community, what do they favor? Oh, she's got to look like this. She's got to be like eight out of 10. I'm not saying that a good-looking woman is not important and not saying a, a, a rich husband is not, is not good to have. But what I'm saying is that when the Prophet Muhammad said, تُنْكِحْ الْمَرْأَةُ لِأَرْبَعَةُ that the woman is married for four things, and he mentioned her beauty and her, her family and, he, and her, her, her wealth. But he says, but, but be successful with the one who is religious. Now, yeah. why is this important? Because, you know, a Nawawi, he mentions in Sharh of this hadith in Sahih Muslim, he says it, when, when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, Tunkah al Mar'a al Mar'a li Arba, he, he said it's not ala Sirat al Amr, meaning it's not, he's not saying you should marry a woman for four yeah. things. He's saying that these are the these four are reasons. The but, uh, yeah. These are the four things In that general. women are married for. But he, and yeah. the Prophet said, okay, these are important. He didn't say, like, you know, go for the one who's most beautiful, who's eight out of ten or nine out of ten. He didn't say go with the one who's got the most money. He says, go with the one who's most religious. Now, the same thing applies for the woman. Like, you can have someone who doesn't have as much money, who might be in a council property, who might be whatever, but he's, he's a man of piety. He's known in the community. Do you know what I'm trying to say? He's, he's memorized the Quran. He's done this. He's done that. That person, okay, is higher if, if his ikhlas mm -hmm. is in place mm -hmm. in the hierarchy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put for him. 
يرفع الله الذين امنوا منكم والذين اوتوا العلم درجات so i think a lot of these discourses get colored with um, a capitalistic lens and we have to really be careful because this is not our it's, it's like feminism it creeps in but we have to remember what is the hierarchy mm-hmm. uh, the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi he mentioned in the hadith um, he mentioned الدنيا ملعونة وملعون ما فيها إلا ذكر الله وعالم ومتعلم that the whole dunya is cursed and everything inside of it is cursed except for the remembrance of Allah and someone who is a teacher who knows and who's a teacher and someone who's learning so there's three there's three things you want in your life ذكر of Allah mm. and you want to teach the deen which is the most important thing even though other knowledges are important as well because the Prophet Sallallahu told us to make dua Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an wa rizqan tayyiban wa amalan mutaqabbala ilman nafi'an here is any beneficial knowledge mm-hmm. but, the, but you know so this is a thing that sometimes in these discourses we're talking about men need to be men what do, do we mean that they need to start studying the religion by that do we mean that they need to start going to pray to pray five times a day by that wake up for fajr by that do we mean that when the Quran says min al mu'minina rijal you know, and then uh, when, uh, from the 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 mu'mins are rijal, uh, oh sorry, the other ayah which which is talks you uh, read you um you read which refers which which links masculinity with with cleanliness. What's what's that link? Mm-hmm. What, what, what's that got to do with alpha and beta? Sorry, nothing to. If you go in the Quran, just forget about the sunnah. Sorry to say, but just go to the Quran and mm-hmm. look at what there's twenty three or twenty four instances with whether rajul rajulan. Is mentioned mm. or Raju, uh, Rijal are mentioned. Anytime ma- the word man is mentioned, look at what it's connected to. It's connected to Iman. It's mm. connected to Nadafa, cleanliness. Mm. It's, it's connected to Qawama, uh, mas- mas- yeah. and protection, uh, yeah. maintenance, like what you've said. Mm. But what we what we do, sometimes we just focus on that one thing, which is Mas'uliya and protection, Qawama, and we forget about all the rest. You know what? Can I just say, I, I hear you and I, and I agree with you, given, you know, expand. And in my thinking on it as well, mashallah. But I, I think, I don't know what it's like now because I think that the, the landscape has changed so much from when we were kind of coming up. Because when we were coming up, it was very clear who was on deen and who wasn't. Sisters got hijab, you were safe to make certain you're making yourself out to be like an older woman, sister. Like what you're wondering. Yes, I am. No, no, no. Um, no. I told like you, I'm an auntie G. I'm an auntie G. No, 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 I'm an auntie G now. Alhamdulillah. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> if, a sister, if a sister wore hijab and she wore abaya, mm. it was safe to make certain assumptions mm. about her lifestyle, about her values, about the kind of marriage she was looking for. Similarly, if a brother had a beard and a thobe and he went to pray at the masjid, it was safe to make certain assumptions about what he expected in a marriage, the role he was going to play, his lifestyle, etc. Mm. My friend, those days are gone. Those days are gone. Mm. those days are gone Mm. because we are such a mix of the elements right now you've got sisters in hijab in the club you've got brothers in thobe selling drugs you know you've got you know this one here with the pornography addiction you've got that one over there who's kind of you know messing about with girls it's it's completely it's no longer black and white so and i think as well people experience this idea of marrying only for Dean. And let's be fair, it's the appearance, isn't it, of Dean? And that's the danger because a lot of people did have the appearance of Dean. Mm. Meanwhile, they've got mental health issues. Meanwhile, they've mm-hmm. got anger management issues. Mm. Meanwhile, she, she's, you know, she's angry with the kids and she beats them when she doesn't look after the house. Nice. Stuff happening, yeah? yeah so yeah, yeah. I agree with you. The Dean should be a priority. However, yep there is a danger of us becoming kind of fooled by people's exteriors. It's not that simple anymore. Because as I said, even though the Muslims that you see now, if you bring a whole group of practicing Muslims together who are, don't all go to the same places, you'll find that their, virgin, their, their views on things are different. Their lifestyles are different. There's certain things they consider to be just fine. Certain things, oh, I want a marriage like this, I want a marriage like that. So it's not so simple anymore. Um, And I think that people need to be really honest with themselves and realize that the appearance of Dean on somebody's external is not all there is to know about that person. You do need to do your due diligence. You need to peel back the layers and we need to be honest with ourselves. That's that's what we need to do. We have to have the Dean as a standard. Yes. All I'm saying is 
we're not in a place anymore where you can say, she looks religious, I'll marry her. Oh no, <laughs> you can't do that. He looks religious, mashallah. I've, you know how many times I've heard had sisters marrying brothers who have mental health issues, yeah? Bipolar, schizophrenia, anger management, whatever. But what did they say at the masjid? Mashallah, he's a good brother. Mashallah, he's a good brother. He's always in the masjid praying. What does that mean? What does that mean? It, it, you, you, if you don't know him beyond, he sits in the dars. I'm sorry, I can't accept just that as a witness. I, I have to get a bit more information than that, you know? And same with the sister. The sisters are crazy out there. Sisters who you know, literally have mental health issues and they, mashallah, wrap up really nicely, covered in hijab, everything, mashallah, sister, salamu alaikum, everything, everything. You marry that sister, you find that she's actually crazy. So mm -hmm. that's all I'm saying. It's, it's not as simple as that anymore. It's tough out there. That's why I said protecting the family unit mm. by making sure that we are all healing firstly. And that's, that's big because so many of us are carrying traumas. And, and it's not like our parents' generation. You know, I had this conversation with Fatima Barakatullah in our Ilm Feed podcast. And I talked about our parents and our grandparents. Their lives were much harder than ours, right? Much harder. I'm sure your grandparents had, had you know, they may have gone through some wars, you know, the immigration, the racism, the you know, poverty, living on the streets, all this kind of thing. But when you ask them about it, it's a long gone memory. They don't even remember it. And they certainly don't say, I was scarred for life. Like I, I, I have never gotten over it. They're just like, it was life. That's what happened. That's I think, you know did. what it is, Naima, on this point, do you know, do you know, like a lot of today's conversation, sorry to cut you off, please remember That's where fine. you stopped, yeah? A, lo a lot of what you said today, you mentioned like key term, we talked about the patriarchy and how it can be misappropriated or it can be misused and, or if it is used, it has some negative connotation. We talked about alpha, beta on the other flip side, mm -hmm. but this, this term trauma, which has become almost a buzzword mm -hmm. now as well. I feel like that itself yeah. can be, it can it reinforce the bad memory like oh yeah. i have all these traumas and these like the, the lexicon has changed to the extent where the lexicon has changed yeah, yeah. The, there's trauma there's triggered yeah triggers uh, toxicity. trauma yeah exactly and what yeah. that does is it just it's kind of like if anything sometimes it can have a negative it can have it can have an adverse effect because it's just it's like like you said I, I, all my all my grandparents are, are gone now but when i was when i was speaking to them when they were alive or even my parents, you know, they, they don't speak in the, that language. That language is unusual. That is unusual language because it, the, the presupposition is almost that we shouldn't be. It's like we're entitled to a life without trial. That's the presupposition. First world problems. Yeah. Yeah. World first world no, but even first world problems, like people in the first world think that they shouldn't be trialed. Like, exactly. the Quran says, do they think people think that they will just be left alone to say we believe and they will not be trialed? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the reality is like that, you know, the trials of this life are for everyone. You know, exactly. every one of us, not just the believers, disbelievers, Muslim men, women, young, old, everybody, everyone's going to get a piece. Ibn al Qayyim says in his book, Shifa al Halil. Um, it's a very good book. Some of it has been translated. It's one of the best books you can probably read on these matters. And he was talking about like um, the dunya and the trials and stuff. And he was, it was, he was basically describing the dunya as a combination of heaven and hell. Basically, if you, uh, I he, didn't, love that. he didn't put Marshall. it in that language. Like I am wow. paraphrasing. Okay. But if you it's put good. heaven and hell together, you have the dunya. If you want to put it, you know, it's, it's I like that. That, that make that. Yeah. I like that. You know what I mean? It's, it, it, it's, there's a reason why it, there's a reason why there's a bit of hell and a bit of heaven in this dunya. It's like Allah yeah, didn't give yeah. us either, either or Either. he gave us mm. both because it's, it's the place, it's the testing ground for the graduation to take place and it will test it will see you the true colors we were talking about certain things happen which ex expose people's true colors yeah this dunya is the is the biggest thing that happens which expose all of our spiritual true colors yeah and the yeah. day of judgment yeah. is what's going to put us <laughs> is where the, the results of of, yeah. of that's going to be manifest 100 percent. i mean i think you know this uh, this issue of and again this is why I keep talking about the cultural context that we live in, because it does affect us. You know, yeah. we can't, none of us can say, very few of us, and I think only those few are the ones who are steeped in Islamic knowledge. And that's a tiny minority of us, majority of us. Yeah, are just not. me and my <laughs> friends actually now. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Hello. Um, steeped in Islamic knowledge. Yes. Uh, and the, your Islamic knowledge informs your thinking. 
it, your, your Islamic knowledge is actually the thing that is, you, your thinking is rooted in that. The, it's a tiny handful of people in the world. Yeah, because, because you read Quran doesn't mean that you, your thinking is like rooted in Islam. It's not the case. Yeah. But what my point is that even, you know, and I, I've been transparent about this, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not a scholar. I'm just a person. Um, and, you know, for yeah, example, just like, just the like hierarchy of needs. Like, I always talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maslow's we're just, hierarchy. Yeah, I mean, we're just trying our best. But Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I find, is very, very... Um, very instructive and I know yeah, I can push back on that because people have said mm, that's mm. not our hierarchy of needs we have a different hierarchy no, of just to like, explain okay, to the viewers the just because this might be uh, something they don't know it's, it's basically a triangular structure at the bottom of which is like you know you have your basic needs like shelter food drink needs. or whatever mm -hmm. and at the top of the pinnacle of this triangular structure is something called self-actualization and according to Maslow, people like Einstein yeah. would have, uh, have, have achieved this self-actualization. People like, I don't know, choose whoever you want, fill in the blank, you know, successful, so-called successful. The goats, person. basically. The goats. Yeah. <laughs> the, the goats and whatever. But, but that's it's, good, it's good. Like you said, it is. I think that's a good way to put it. It is definitely instructive because it gives us something to, to opt for. I mean, the, Quran, the Islam, sorry, the Quran is in the Hadith where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has his own triangular structure, which yeah. is Umal Islam and then the five pillars, Umal Iman and then the six pillars. Then Umal Ihsan and Tabud Allah ka and the Katara. Fain Lam Takun Tarahu, Fain Nahirak. Ihsan's at the top of it. Like, you know, we've got our own one, but certainly Maslow's one I think is instructive as well. Yeah. Keep going. What's interesting to me, so what's interesting to me with this hierarchy of needs, at the bottom is basic needs food, shelter, you know, food, drink, shelter, I think it is. I think intimacy is in there, sex is there. Yeah, yeah. Next up from that is emotional needs, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's sort of, uh, I think it's not professional, but it's like mission. And then self actualization. Social I'm, structures, I'm completely butchering friends and I'm social completely structures. Butchering this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, go and Google it, please. It's there for everyone to see. <laughs> but my point is this mm -hmm. is that my observation is that when the lower people are on the hierarchy of needs, as in if you're still at basic needs level, it's very easy to be satisfied because all you need is your basic needs to be met. Once you have transcended basic needs and you start to go into higher pursuits, the higher you go and the higher you aim on that triangle, the more likely you are to be frustrated and disappointed because not everybody reaches the top of that triangle. Some people stay on the basic level. Some people will go up to having their emotional needs met, but there are children even today who don't get their emotional needs met. We know this, okay? Maybe they have a home, maybe their parents feed them, they make sure they go to school, but their emotional needs are not being met. Maybe the parents don't know how to do it. Maybe the parents themselves never had their emotional needs met, whatever the case may be. Anyway, I digress. My point is we need to be careful because we're living in a world where that bottom is done. First world problems means that we're always looking at self-actualization we're looking at you know me uh, you know kind of uh, finding myself and, and and becoming the better version of myself and 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 usually not in a religious way but in other ways yeah. right yeah i think my concern for my community is that we aim so high that we firstly neglect to be grateful for what we have and we also are not able to be satisfied so we are constantly chasing the dragon and that means that we're always in this perpetual state of chasing after the dunya, because that's what it is, it's chasing dunya. And that dunya could be the relationship, it could be money, it could be uh, you know, a certain lifestyle, it could be academic pursuits, whatever it is, right? But I just want us to be circumspect, I think, mm -hmm. and try to have a balanced approach to it. Because even in relationships, we're seeing it. You know, people expect more from their relationships now than they did 20 years ago, even Muslims. And I think that is one of the other reasons that is driving high divorce rates in the community, because one partner has a higher expectation for the relationship than the other. And the other one is perfectly satisfied. Listen, we're together. You cook for me. I've got wonderful kids. Alhamdulillah, I'm happy. I'm good. She's like, we don't do date nights. You never listen to me. You don't really see me. I feel like you don't appreciate me. I want more. I want a best friend. I want a companion. I want all new things, yeah? 
these are new things because when they first got together, this was not the conversation. When they first got together, it was Bismillah for the sake of Allah. You're going to give me your rights. You're going to give me my rights. I'm going to give you your rights. It's easy. Yeah, because remember back in the day, that's what everybody thought. A successful marriage is what? Two people get married for the sake of Allah. They fulfill each other's rights happily ever after. That's what people thought. But the more we want and the more we demand from our partners, and I'm going to switch this because I don't want to be accused of bias. Let me switch it. The now say it, say like, it, say it, say it. We want to hear that. We want to hear the female problems as well. Yeah, no, no, I'm going to say. It. So the sister is. No, this is not the. This is the husband's problem because the sister's problem a lot of the time is, you know, she has a vision for her life, and a vision for her relationship, but her husband doesn't meet her there anymore. Like maybe her vision was here before. Once she starts to elevate that vision, he, he's not following her. He's like, well, what are you doing all that for? Like you're doing too much. Just relax. We're good. And she's like, oh, but I want this, but I need that, and. Her needs are changing. She's, she's evolving. She's becoming a different person. So that has caused a lot of friction. And I, I've seen this more and more in the community, right? So that's that. Flip side, sisters like, alhamdulillah, I've got my husband, I've got my kids. You know, we don't have all the money in the world, but we're happy, yeah? And I'm, 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 I'm happy with where we're at. Meanwhile, the husband's like, you put on weight, you know? And he's thinking of, you know, like, how could my maybe life maybe he be? likes that maybe maybe you know, no 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 then the, we're flipping it we're flipping it remember so for yeah. him he's thinking I, i'm this person i should have this type of wife a lot of our brothers unfortunately are you know not a lot no i'm gonna say a lot of our brothers porn addiction is a thing my yeah. wife doesn't do what those women do this is a problem for me 